be left out. Him and his friend, they waiting on their ride, and he walked and looked to see if he see the the ride coming, and somebody just walked up on him and shot him three times up close. Leonard L.A. Capone Anderson was an up-and-coming rapper from Chicago's Southside and a member of Black Disciples 600 set alongside other infamous Chi-Town spitters like Rondo No. 9 and 600 Breezy. Looking to make it out of the Chicago war zone, Capone teamed up with the fast-rising Lil Durk, became associated with Durk's Only the Family crew. With their support, L.A. Capone was set to become one of the most promising acts in hip-hop before it was tragically ripped away. In September of 2013, after having spent a full day recording in the studio, Capone was on his way home when he was approached in an alleyway and shot multiple times in the hip and lower back. A few short hours later, Capone would bleed out on the operating table as doctors fought frantically to save his life. It was a devastating conclusion to the story of a young man with limitless potential. But you ever wondered what really happened that night and just who was involved? Then keep watching our newest episode of Before They Were Gone. L.A. Capone was born Leonard Anderson on September 18th, 1996 in the south side of Chicago, Illinois. As a child, Capone's parents separated when he was still very young, and from that point forward, he was raised solely by his mother, Deidre Morris, who treated her only baby boy like a prince. Speaking with DNA Info, she told them he knew he was special because he was the only boy. For his first birthday, I bought him a gold crown, and I wouldn't let anybody call him anything but king. I was so happy I had a son. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, Capone would come to associate himself with the local neighborhood sets like the 600, an offshoot of the Black Disciples and a particularly dangerous one at that. We do for 600, man. Hey, 600 up next, man. OTF, man. That's what it is, yeah. man. Only the family, man. As Capone was searching for a way to express himself and perhaps escape the lifetime of dangers that comes part and parcel with growing up in Chicago, he met an up-and-coming rapper named Lil Durk at the age of 12. Durk would take the young rapper under his wing, and these two quickly struck up a close friendship with Capone joining Durk's OTF. Under Lil Durk's mentorship, LA Capone started crafting his own hip-hop bangers, and by March of 2012, he was finally releasing some of his earliest tracks like Murder, Round Here, and some more. It would take Capone a little over a year to create his first major hit, his single Play For Keeps, which dropped in July of 2013. With over 51 million views and counting, Play For Keeps would announce to the entire world that L.A. Capone was here to stay. Unfortunately, it would also prove to be his swan song as well. On the evening of September 26, 2013, the man known as L.A. Capone was just finishing up a day well spent in the recording studio working on his debut project. Having just recently turned 17, only the week before, Capone had ordered himself a brand new polo hoodie and was eager to find out if it had arrived. He called his mom and spoke with her, asking about the package. She told him it had just been delivered and it would be the last conversation that these two ever had with one another. Around 6 p.m., Capone Capone hit the streets outside the studio, looking for his ride home. As he walked down an alley near 70th Street and Stony Island Avenue, he was snuck up on from behind, and before he knew what was happening, four shots rang out, striking him in his thigh and lower back. At the time of the attack, Capone's mother, Deidre, was actually nearby when she passed by a ton of police. At the moment, she thought nothing of it, but when she got home, she received a phone call from a friend that would change her life forever. Knowing that her son had been attacked, but that he was apparently still alert and talking, Deidre hightailed it to the hospital. As she rushed to her son's side, she believed strongly that he would survive the attack. After all, only about a year prior, he had survived a previous shooting that required lengthy surgeries to save his life. But this time, unfortunately, was different. September 29th, 2012, he got shot the first time, and then he passed away September 26, 2013. I remember going to the hospital and, and um, my kid's father telling me, like, man, we gonna tell Leonard ass next year from September the 20th to October the 1st, this, he gotta stay in the house. But September, this last week of September is not a good, you know, it ain't a good time for him. He needs to stay in the house next year around this time, you know, not knowing that. I'm gonna be a next time. Upon arriving at the hospital, Deidre located her mother who had made it there before her. That's when she heard her mom scream. Deidre knew then and there what exactly had happened. Her son hadn't made it through the surgery and he had simply lost too much blood. I took him to the hospital and he was there in surgery for you know, about two or three hours and then he came out and said that he didn't make it because he was losing too much blood. As fast as they were pumping it in, it was coming back out because his heart was beating. To make matters even worse, upon returning home that night, Deidre had to contend with her son's birthday cake that was still sitting on the kitchen counter as a grim reminder of what had just transpired. She threw it away untouched. Deidre would not be the only person to mourn Capone's passing. 
After hearing about what happened to his protege, Lil Durk quickly posted RIP Lil Bro from his Twitter account. Yeah, Dirk was there, Dirk was there at the hospital with you guys? Yeah, yeah it was me, Dirk, um, twin, his mama, Gotti, a couple other mothers, sisters, grandma, all that stuff. And then they came out and told everybody. They told his immediate family to step, like, step closer to where they was at. But I, I was like, I didn't really want to hear, because I ain't going to lie, like, I just feel like Every time I ever got to hit something and it's between, the outcome can either be good or bad. Usually when it's me, it's usually bad. The ramifications of this violent attack also reverberated throughout the Chicago gang scene. At first, no one really knew who was responsible, with many people speculating Capone had been attacked by someone from the gangster disciple set after dissing one of their dead members in Play For Keeps. But as time unfolded, it gradually became clear that the attack had been ordered by 051 Young Money crew, apparently in retaliation for the killing of their former member Remember, Antonio Fathead Davis, whose death L.A. Capone was rumored to be involved with. A little less than a year after the murder of L.A. Capone, the news would finally break that three people had been charged with his murder. Saki Hardy Johnson and Michael Mays had been the trigger men who followed Capone into the alleyway that night. Both these men would be charged with first degree murder. Shortly thereafter, a third man, Mako Buchanan, would be convicted as the driver of a tail car that was intended to insulate the others while they made their move. All three men would confess to being involved in Capone's death. Only two weeks after his friend's passing, Rondo would release the single, Life of a Savage, in commemoration of his life. It truly did serve as a bittersweet reminder that as talented as a young man as L.A. Capone was, he never lived long enough to release a full-length album or mixtape. Thankfully, his boys at OTF would take care of that for him by digging into his recording archives and releasing the posthumanist mixtape, Separate Myself, in April of 2014 followed up by the second and final mixtape, King LA. These works would serve as a fitting end for a young man whose life was taken far too soon, depriving all of us from seeing what could have been next for this promising artist. I don't know how to you know, playing a funeral for my son, I don't know what to do, I don't know. It just feel like it's like a weight that's sitting right here on my chest, my chest just hurt. Can't nothing in the world prepare you for that. When I woke up yesterday morning, I didn't think when I went to bed last night that my son was going to be in him. Alright guys, so that'll bring us to the end of the life story of L.A. Capone. Please be sure to leave us your favorite memories of the man in the comments down below. And I'll see you guys in another video.